So, these are monumental times for the education system in Sevenoaks. Here at uh, Noel Academy, it's two years old in September and is currently planning an £18.2 million upgrade into the building here. The town of Sevenoaks itself was in the headlines nationally in March when a plan for a grammar school in Sevenoaks was given the go-ahead. And currently, the government is considering an application for a Christian free school in the town and uh, as you'll probably hear tonight, we, uh, news of that is going to be is very imminent. Now, this all comes uh, as in a few years, the area will face a shortfall in secondary school places. Now, I'm Roger Casper, I'm editor of the Seven Notes Chronicle, and we've led the way in reporting in detail all of these uh, educational issues and kept readers fully appraised of every twist and turn in the, in the debate. And we're very pleased to host uh, tonight's evening, which is in association with Seven Oaks ACE, uh, Action for Community Education. They've organised the event and they are currently surveying residents on what they want from the school systems locally. So far they've had more than 700 responses and hope to get to the magic 1,000. Uh, and tonight we hope to come up with some, answers, some way to answering lots of the questions that you will have on the important issues for our children here. And I'm delighted to say we have a panel that reflects and can answer all of the issues currently under debate. So, with no further ado, let me introduce them to you. Peter Reed is an education consultant who specialises in school appeals and admissions. He is a former grammar school teacher, head teacher, and in fact, he's my former head teacher. So, sir, would you like to come up and take your seat? <laughs> Peter Reed, everyone. Bill Latimer is part of the Christian Free School bid, a father of four grown up children and chairman of Churches Together in Seven Oaks and District. He was part of the presentation team that put forward his case to the Department of Education. Bill, would you like to come up, please? Mary Boyle was head teacher of Bradbourne School, which, together with Wilderness, came together to form Knoll Academy, of which she is the principal. A recent Ofsted Academy inspection concluded it had made good progress towards raising standards. Mary, would you like to come up, please? <laughs> and I was expecting to say that our fourth uh, panellist was going to be late tonight, but he's here. So, uh, uh, Richard Parry, Kent County Councillor, uh, he's been to a previous engagement as uh, Seven Oaks Mayor tonight. Um, he's been a driving force behind the Grammar School campaign. Um, so, Richard, would you come up, please? <laughs> now, unfortunately, uh, Andrew and Sarah Schilling, whose campaign sparked the uh, KCC vote in March, uh, are unable to attend tonight, but I'm hoping that Mr Parry can go some way to representing their views and answering some of the questions they have posed to me in a statement. Um, I've got quite a full statement to read, of which um, I've taken a couple of questions, and in fact, I think we should start off the debate with the first question, which goes to, to Mary. Um, this is from Mr and Mrs Shilling, Mary. Um, with its new building programme, will the Knoll Academy be able to attract back some of the 407 age children who attend all ability non-faith schools in other towns? I don't actually think that education is necessarily about buildings. I think it's much more about culture, ethos of schools. Um, we are a relatively new school. We do have an £18.3 million pound build, which has gone for planning in the last uh, six weeks. Um, but for me, it's much more about improving facilities um, which, which will enable us to um, meet the culture and ethos vision of our governors and our, our sponsors. So I, do, I don't actually think in itself that buildings um, make that much difference. It's about building reputations and um, showing that you can actually achieve results and enable children to uh, fulfil their potential. Um, Bill, what do you think about that question? Uh, well, obviously, it's a significant issue for people in the town, the number of children who have to travel a long way for, 
to go to school, whether that is to a selective or to a non-selective school. And I think it'd be wonderful if we could have more school places in Seven Oaks. That's what we need. We have this facility which is going to get even better with the new buildings and all the improvements that Mary's putting in hand. I think if we get the Christian Free School, which we'll find out in the next couple of days, then um, we'll have uh, more choice in Seven Oaks, which means that people won't feel that they need to go outside Seven Oaks. And that way we can build more community and have more local education and less travel. Thank you. Uh, Richard Parry, where do you stand with Grammar Schools, Knoll Academy and the Christian Free School? Well, firstly I have to say I'm in an absolutely super school. Uh, I've known Mary for a long time and I think that in her previous life, two years ago, she was an outstanding head and she has continued to do so. And all the, the 18 and a half million pound Build will do is give her even better facilities to be a better school. So I think she'd have no problem in bringing children here. So that's the first answer. I, I would see the grammar school, which I strongly support, and sometimes Mary and I don't see eye to eye on this, but we argue in the way we would have it if we'd been the same university late at night with a variety of alcohol and in a friendly thing. But I think the two schools would coexist and should build efforts get off the ground, and as he says, we sit in here with bated breath, I can see all three establishments catering for the different needs of the different children who live in the area. So the answer, I think, in broad terms is that if it comes to fruition in the way we all hope it will be, then we will have in Seven Oaks several different centres of excellence which will allow the parents of Seven Oaks and its outlying districts the, the, the choice they want, the choice they clearly express, and also we will attract people from far and wide to what will be a growing centre of excellence. So I, I see nothing, nothing but positive, uh, as Jerry Spicer once said, positivity in the whole thing that is hopefully going to happen in seven. Thank you. Mary, do you see the grammar school as a threat? Um. We were set up as an all-ability school, which means that we should be able to take the full range of ability. Um, I think, and I've had long discussions with Richard about this, that the more children who go to grammar school, the more the other children are put into high schools, in, in, particularly in Kent, which means that you concentrate some of the social issues that Kent has into specific schools. So in itself, I don't see it as a threat, but I would like the academy to have the full range of ability. And I know that's what the sponsors and the governors would want as well. Do you feel, do you feel they're not going to get that if, if people are concentrating on grammar schools? Clearly, at the moment, about 40% of children uh, go to grammar schools in, in West Kent. Um, usually, it's 25% is, is, is the percentage. So if 40% of children go to grammar schools, that means that 60% of children go to the high schools. So, that, for example, if you, um, if you have an Ofsted inspection, you, you have to get above average in your GCSE results, even to get a good. The, the goalposts are changing all the time, but to get a good, that, that basically means you have to have above average um, attainment. Now, if you have children coming into the school who are below average and uh, in attainment when they arrive, to actually get them to above average attainment when they do their GCSE, it's quite difficult. It's, it's a challenge. Um, we do do it at Noel Academy, and our results are improving all the time. But nevertheless, what you're doing is you're, you're almost saying you, the best you can get is a satisfactory because you don't have the whole range of ability. So I think it would be fairer if 25% of children went to grammar schools. You know, we, we wouldn't start necessarily from here if we're creating an education system, but we have to work with what we, what we have at the moment. So I think that would be much fairer. What I think will happen is if there is another grammar school, it will basically, the number is more likely to increase 50%.
Peter, what do you think of the uh, education system in Seven Oaks? Well, there isn't an education system in Seven Oaks, is there? <laughs> We've only got uh, one academy, and as a result, large numbers of children move out of Seven Oaks. Um, Mary's referred to the, the 40%. Um, however, it has to be said that the pass rate for grammar schools right across the county is 25%. They just happen to be, and it's unsurprising looking at the, uh, the catchment area, more children of the appropriate ability in this area, which is why 40% get selected. Of course, we have arguments about coaching, which I know are going to come up later, that may well have inflated that. But I'm actually questioning whether, and uh, I'm leaping about amongst the questions I know are coming, whether there's actually a need for a grammar school annex, and I'll explain why. Um, this year, by the end, before the appeals took place, I think every girl living in the selected area of Seven Oaks had been offered a grammar school place. Next year, Wheel of Kent has increased its catchment by another 30 children. So I just can't see where girls are going to come from. Because I believe that girls who pass the 11 plus will still want to go to Weald of Kent or Tunbridge Grammar School rather than an unproven annex. It's got to achieve its reputation somehow, but I actually don't think there are enough girls to go around. And the planning is for a mixed grammar school annex. So that's an issue. But Seven Oaks, I must repeat, is not here in isolation. We've got 120 children from out of county that come across the boundaries into Kent. And a lot of people say, well, they're forcing our children out. We mustn't ever forget there's 145 West Kent children moving out of the county into Sussex. So we're actually a net exporter rather than importer of children. Richard, have you got a view on what Peter's just said? Well, yes. Uh, firstly, the, an the proposed annex are single sex, um, and the legislation currently doesn't allow that. Uh, that would be corrected by education, but that the plan is for a two form single sex entry. Um, in terms of people travelling, if you've ever seen what happens on the coaches and on the buses and the three-hour round trip every day, which detracts from the children's well-being and prevents them staying at school or gives them a very long school day, you would understand the, the reason why people want to have schooling much, much closer to home. Uh, so that's what it is. And the Greenwich, the Greenwich judgment which causes us to take people from across is, is a spurious argument. So I really have to say that, uh, it, let's go back to what the shillings did. They started a petition, they got two and a half thousand people in a very short space of time to say, we really want grammar school education for our children in the Sevenoaks, where we can get them there easily. It'd be much greener and lots of other advantages. And what we have to remember is that, not what educationists want, what parents want for their children. And parents want for their children the, the education which satisfies the children's abilities, the parents' aspirations, and also gives them the ability to be involved in family life. And traveling an hour and a half to a school on a bus in an uncomfortable situation where you're in the bus because you want to be with your friends. So while there is in theory a seat for everybody on that bus, because everybody's crowded together, the answer. So it's not a comfortable existence. So the answer is, I hear what Peter says, I just think he's completely wrong. Yes, um, my name is Maya Ford, and I'm a parent of three. I have my eldest in year five. I think something you're also forgetting about the travelling is the grammar schools, uh, you're forgetting about the financial um, cost of everything, that uh, the people who um, don't have much money coming in, not only um, are they excluded from being able to um, coach their children, so therefore the super selective schools are quite often out of their grasp, but the cost also of having a child travel that distance, 
I think you're you're wrong. People would want somewhere that their children can walk to. Was that was that aimed at Peter or just the panel? Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have a question at this moment on this issue? Thank you. Would you like to speak? Again, I challenge uh, what has been said in terms of um, people ruling out and annexing seven lakes um, on the grounds that it is not being fully proven. Sorry, can I ask a supplementary to that, which is, I see that the uh, primary school is intended, uh, if it's successful, to open in September 2015, and I question, as a lay person, why does it take so long uh, to do that? Why can an annex not be up and running any quicker than that, given that I believe there's a demand in Seven Oaks, and um, there's clearly some facilities here, but what is it that means that it takes uh, three years for that to happen? Richard, can you ask uh, an answer that and just tell us what the latest um, state of play is on Grammar School Annex, please? Yes, I'm going to apologise for sitting down. Other people are bobbing up and down. I had major ankle surgery, which the surgeon is terribly pleased with, and I think he probably did a good job, but he prevents me standing for long. The answer is we've looked very carefully at the logistics and what might happen, um, and local government doesn't move swiftly, the government moves even slower. So the best guess is that we, we will be able to deliver on in September 2015. The possibility of getting there earlier is it's a very long shot and we would rather be sure that we get the process in place by next April which allows us to deliver. So I'm afraid while we'd like to do it sooner, we don't think it's feasible. can just uh, return to the comments. Um, I talked about girls, I didn't mention boys, um, and I think girls, you have got the Tunbridge of the Wilbur Kent Grammar School locally, you've got the super selectives, which I think, as the lady over there indicated, if they're accessible, people will go for them. So, I'm not saying a grammar school of sorts is not viable here. What I'm saying is, I think there are major concerns about the balance of boys and girls. I don't know if we've found two grammar schools yet, a boys' grammar school and a girls' grammar school that are going to work together. Uh, and perhaps Mr. Parry can tell us what progress has been made here. But I've heard people discussing this issue in education, and I'm not convinced it's that straightforward to find two schools that will work together, a boys' grammar school and a girls' grammar school, with their different, uh, and they're supposed to come up with a common ethos. And I think there are a number of challenges, particularly for a girls' grammar school, who may not wish to invest the time. I don't know the answer to that question, there may be one out there. It's not just grammar school children who travel and who have those costs. In fact, up until last year, if you went to a grammar school and it was your closest, it was your first preference, you actually had your costs of travel paid for you. Whereas if you came to the Bradbourne School or Knoll Academy and you got in um, on the 10% of students who come in on um, Express Arts Aptitude, you still had to pay for your travel. Uh, we have a large number of children whose uh, parents choose to send the children here rather than, than the school in the north of the district. And they do have uh, the same similar costs in the travel. I think the problem that we need to face is that we're not just, you can't just look at Seven Oaks as a town. You have to look at all the rural, rural parishes as well and the cost of travel into Seven Oaks for them. For some of them, it's, it's, um, it's less expensive perhaps to go to Tunbridge, but there is the Freedom Pass, which I know that um, Richard might, might want to talk about, and there is some subsidy for sixth form as well. But in a, in a semi-rural area, you are always going to have the, the issue about transport and children moving from one place to another. And then there is the issue about parental choice. So parents can actually choose where to send their child to some extent. Um, the, the less well-off you are, the fewer choices you have because you do have to look at the cost of school meal, transport and so on. So, if you live in a semi-rural area, the, the, the chances are that if you're less well off, you will be more disadvantaged in terms of your choice.
Can, can you tell us if um, the, the satellite scores have vanished, or have they got a farther yet? I, I can't open the domain on this one, but we are confident from the discussions we have that by April we will have a package in place. And you have to read into that whatever you like, but we are confident in, in April next year we will be ready to, to perhaps open the domain. Any more questions at all from the floor on this particular issue? Could you just tell, tell us your name and um, you know, why you're asking the question if you're sure. a parent? Sure, my, my name's Nick Kennard. Um, I, I, I think we should set the context as well. We're talking, we're just assuming that the selective education system is, is here and is going to stay, but we should reflect on the fact that the vast majority of the country does not use a selective education system. Many people regard it as a discredited system. It's phased out in the majority of the country. It's being phased out now in Northern Ireland. And other aspects such as extended travel times are a, are a key feature of, of selective education. Because you're segregating people based on ability, um, you do, one of the features is you, you will have been increased travel times. Uh, one person on the panel talked about centres of excellence. Um, I think that's difficult to, to, to apply to what is essentially will be a secondary model. A secondary model. Because if you do put a grammar school in Seven Oaks or an Annex, then effectively what you're saying is that this school that we're in now is a secondary modern, and that's, I think that's difficult to be described as a, as a centre of excellence. Um, I think what, what parents want, parents want a good local school, and I think what, we, what many of us want is, is a school that doesn't segregate based on gender, faith or ability, and we shouldn't just assume that that's what people want, because I don't think they do want that. Um, so I think, that, I think the context is very important, because we started off and we've just assumed that Kent is, is, is stuck with the selective education system, but I think there's also a very important debate to be had, and perhaps it's outside of the direct scope this evening, but there is a debate to be had about the selective education system that we have in Kent, and whether, whether we do have to be stuck with it, um, because I think that's something that should be questioned fundamentally. Peter, do you think the selective school uh, system is discredited? I think, as Mary said right at the beginning, I believe, um, we wouldn't start from here. Oh, great, absolutely. We're where we are. We have a massive independent sector in Seven Oaks. And that, I think, is actually the larger divide than grammar schools and non-selective schools. Um, Mary's talked about North Seven Oaks, and we mustn't ever forget there's a whole hinterland north of Seven Oaks. And I've been dealing with parents in the last few weeks who are looking at the Noel Academy from as far north as Halstead. Um, those children. There's no doubt about it. They see Noel Academy as a centre of excellence compared to the alternatives. Well, I would like to think so as well. Um, but, but if you have a, a, a system of uh, academic segregation, you have an 11 plus, and you have a you have a situation where if you don't pass it at 11 plus, you're called a failure. I mean, look at your paper just a few weeks ago. Uh, the headline across the front: 11 plus failures. I mean, that's what it is. Not passing 11 plus means you have failed that exam, and you, then you go to a school like this, and, and you can't remove that label, that's part of it. If you want selective education, you don't just get grammar schools for a small uh, number of people at the top, you get secondary moderns for the vast majority of children, and that lets them down, I think. Can I just challenge what you said to say a school like this? Huh? I almost say, how do you say that in this centre of excellence? This is a, a tremendous school which is delivering I'm not the one who's undermining it. I'm not the one who's undermining it. I, I, I classify it as effectively a secondary modern, which is what essentially you're doing. You may call it what you like. Very but it is nice. a secondary modern, isn't it? it is. This, this, this is a, the grammar school system has grammar schools and secondary moderns. No, we have, we have, throughout Kent, we have a range of secondary applications. We have academies, we have high schools. But to brand children who who do not pass the emphasis failures, I think is tautology, tautologically unsound. Well, well you may want to refer look, to the editor so of the I'm going to let you finish your sentences. Yes. I'm going to let you finish your sentences, and I hope you will let me finish mine. I don't really mind, but we could, could have each other. But I don't think we, you and I, should monopolize this. But to brand children who do not pass the emphasis failures is wrong. We live in a society which is competitive by nature. We strive all the time. We will be, in two weeks' time, we will be watching people running, jumping, and doing all the swimming, cycling, and they will be competing to win. They will be competing physically. In a little later on, at Brands Hatch, we will see people who are not as physically able as others doing exactly the same thing. 
In other spheres of life, people compete intellectually. So we live in a society where you compete all the time. And if you, if you don't allow this competition uh, intellectually and uh, in any way, then you are not helping the children. Now, Mary's school, I used to be a government for a very brief time at the previous school. They look at the children and they help them do the very best. If you're really, really bright, they make sure you exercise like that. If you have other skills, you just have to come to the exhibitions in this place. This is an all-ability school where no matter whether you're uh, kind of an intellectual, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an education, or really um, an artisan, they will make the very, very best of you. Andrew, why do you use the expression of all-ability and not comprehensive? Why not call it a comprehensive then, if you want to call it all-ability? Um, but I think, I think in a sense you've hit the nail on the head, I can just go back to that person on the end. I think you have hit the nail on the head when you talk about competitive society. And in a sense, it's a political issue. You know, if you want to entrench a competitive, hierarchical society, then the grammar school system, indeed, does, does, does very much entrench that approach to, to society. And it is a, it is a political issue. Um, it is, and I think you've hit the nail on the head, because for many people, it is, a, it, is a, it is a political issue. And that's the kind of society you want to see an hierarchical, competitive society. And the grammar school system um, a, a, a establishes that ethos from a very young age. Um, I totally agree with you. We are an all ability school. I would much prefer to call it comprehensive why, why, school. Why don't you have um, Because the Academy um, articles say we are an all ability school. Um, Kent would call us a non selective school. In the same way, I would never call one of my admin or support staff a non teacher. Mm. I, I hate the word non, it's such a negative. Absolutely. You put that yeah. in the front of everything. Um, we don't have a top end, we have some children. We don't have comprehensive schools in inner London have 25% of the more stable, it used to be called band one, and there is still some banding in the country. 50% band two, and 25% band three, which are, were usually children who had some sort of special educational needs. Um, I spent 16 years in a school like that. I sent, as head of sixth form, with 420 in my sixth form, about 10 children, young people, to Oxford every year. Um, 15 more to Exeter, quite a few to York, and those were some universities. But the least able were also catered for. It was a vibrant, multicultural, mixed gender. Um, society where you got in because you lived close to the school. It was, it was an amazing place, it still is. Um, that, that would be my vision for the perfect school. Um, so we don't, we don't have a top end of the 25%. We do have some parents who choose to send the children here who have passed the 11 plus, or who would have passed the 11 plus, but, um, but, but they don't actually want the child to sit in. Um, so, uh, you know, for me, I, I totally accept I live in Kent, it's a conservative and always will be majority conservative, and I have to work within the system, if we could change the system, great, but I wouldn't start from here, Absolutely. I would start from somewhere else. Yeah, great. Okay, any more questions at all on this current issue before we move on? Oh, thank you, Marie. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a, clearly I've not got children in school, but I have four children educated in this area, and I've got 13 grandchildren all educated in this area. Most of them are grown up, four still at school, the others are all passed on. Um, and my questions, I've got two questions in follow on. I would say research has shown that a child's best chance of getting into a university is to be born into a family where, where at least one parent went to university. How much do you think the support, educationally and financially, of parents is vital to a school's success? And then following on from that, I would say a second question is, does a system which indirectly selects the most motivated parents and leaves other schools to deal with problem parents and students make for an educational system in which all children have a good chance of success? Thank you, yes. Um, the, the first 
question was about one parent and one parent goes to university, then children got their chance going to university. It, this is another reason why it is so important that we have more local school places in settlements. Because if you look at our primary schools here, which are brilliant by and large, we have a huge amount of parental involvement in those schools. And that's good for the schools, it's good for the families, it's good for the children. And if we can have more children educated in Seven Oaks, whether that's at here, whether it's at the Christian preschool, whether it's at the Grammar Annex, then we'll have parental involvement in those schools. We'll have the uh, children having much more time in the school day when they're not sitting on buses. There'll be much more after school clubs, sports, all sorts of things. And so we'll have a much closer relationship. So it, it certainly, in our view, parental involvement uh, in education is absolutely key uh, to children's education. Then the second part of your question, I think, was about is it, um, is it a good system, back to the 11th class, I think, aren't we, uh, which privileges um, well, people who... Where, where schools select the most motivated select parents. Select the most motivated parents, and I think we're back to the same issue about whether the 11th class is a good thing or a bad thing. As far as we're concerned, we don't have a view on that. We are where we are, and we're trying to work within the system we have in Kent. I wonder if by motivated parents you're thinking of uh, parents that are coaching their children, is that what you... Well, also parents who are, are very supportive educationally and financially of their children. And let's face it, some parents aren't supportive, and they often have children who are problems. And the, the selective schools can chuck those children out. And so you're, you've got an unfair system, which I think you should challenge the system rather than going along with it. I think that behind every motivated child, there is a motivated parent. Um, my husband would say that behind every motivated headmistress, there is a motivated husband who... <laughs> but um, yet another evening not seeing him. But uh, no, I think you're absolutely right. And ch children who don't have a motivated parent have only the school system to rely upon to motivate them. We have children who come here in year seven. Um, many of them have failed the 11 plus, so they think they're a failure. So the first thing we have to do here is build self-esteem. And our pastoral system and our counselling and our learning mentors and, and all the activities we do, our school productions, our concerts, our choir, all of these things are put in place to build self-esteem. Because some children come here They've, they've, they've been branded a failure, don't sit the 11 plus, or you might sit in a fail. Um, but they do have parents who want them to succeed, the vast majority. Where the issues are is where you have parents who it's quite difficult even to get into the school. Now that is more likely to be in a school that hasn't selected its children, but I'm sure that other schools, grammar schools as well, and uh, independent schools would also have some parents like that. So I totally agree with you. Um, my father said, education is a great social leveller. And being Scottish, we were, you know, education uh, was held in high esteem. The teachers were held in high esteem. And the head teachers were just like, you know, God, really. I, I, uh, I, it was absolutely incredible. So the more the pay, we, we think that education, educating a child and giving them opportunities is a triangle. Um, it's the parent, the child, and the school. And the more the school can do to support along and get the parents on board, sometimes you do actually have to educate the parents to, to be involved and, and, and to show them how much their child will benefit. So I totally agree with you on that one. Um, Yes, behind every problem child, there is a problem parent. And I won't say any more, I'll leave it there. Yes, indeed. Um, I operate right across Kent, and you're mainly some of parents, I can tell you, we will be having a very, very different discussion in Thanet. Um, I've been talking to parents over the last month who keep telling me their child's got into the tech. Um, the tech, it's one of the grammar schools that gave up the title of tech 10, 20 years ago. And, and, and this, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to upset some people here, this obsession 
that seems to breed through Seven Oaks of my child has to go to the highest status school they can possibly get or the neighbours will say something terrible about me. There's a, a website that I call Neurotics Anonymous. Um, it's well worth studying, but don't get sucked into it. From that, you learn that parents are tutoring their children from the age of four for the 11 plus. What a childhood. Now, that doesn't happen in East Kent, <laughs> I'm pleased to say. And the level of coaching is there. But a consequence of that is the obsession with coaching here, which has actually perverted the whole balance of education because we've talked about the 25% and the 40%, and there are clearly more talented children here than there are in Thanet, and uh, I don't know whether I should be uh, shot for that, but, but, but it's a fact. But that coaching is just boosting this figure, which is creating a number of the problems. I, I was going to be asked what percentage of children who pass the 11 plus have been to a private junior school, yeah. or have tutoring. I almost never come across a parent who hasn't tutored their child. I have a lot who say, well, I'm not going to tell anybody, <laughs> but that's different. But private schools here, um, I've actually got the statistics in front of me, and about 30% of all children in the selected West Kent area go to private schools. It's an astonishing statistic. I don't think they're necessarily going because they're better schools. This is primary school. Some are going because they can't get into a good primary school. I've been told I can't talk about the problems of primary schools in Seven Oaks, which happens above are big enough themselves. But parents are faced, motivated parents, with not getting into a good state private school, primary school, so they're going private. Or they're going private because they want the super selective schools for all sorts of reasons. So this coaching goes on and on and on. Nearly, well, it's around 30% of all select children living in this, what we call the selective areas of West Kent go to private schools. I think that's an astonishing figure. And that, as I said earlier, is the big divide. Now, let's just look at those figures. So we've got 766 in private schools, 37% of those actually have passed. In the state schools in the area, 1,697 children, 33% have passed. So we've got a higher percentage passing, but actually the statistic which I won't bore you with gets even tougher when you look at the higher scores in the 11 plus, because that's when the independent schools come out properly, because coaching to get the very, very highest scores is actually almost becoming, I believe, unattainable for children in most state primary schools. And I think that's very sad. Now, you've got to have either the intensive coaching or private school. Some children do it, with one, I doubt that children do it without either. And, and I think that the 11 plus, yeah, it is questioned whether it's working properly as it stands at the moment. And KCC have responded to that and have acknowledged that fact and are looking at it. But please don't think that the culture in Seven Oaks is typical of the whole of Kent. Richard Parry, are you aware of children at the age of four being coached, and what's your view on that? Well, the answer to the first one, no, I don't know any child of four who was being coached, but then perhaps I'm a visionary child of line. Um, I have a son who's now in his 30s, uh, who went to Amherst, no coaching, and one, and, one, and passed 11 plus. He wasn't coached, but he was helped at home. Um, he came home if he had a problem, either his mother was clever and I would help him. And that's what parents of all abilities do. Um, unless you 
don't cherish your children. I, I don't want to go there. But if any parent who cares for their child, the child asks the question, they try to answer the question, no matter what it is. Yes, there is some coaching. I think Peter's been disingenuous in this particular thing. Um, uh, yes, the, the, the percentage for the state, for the private sector is higher, but they are allowed to coach in the schools. Uh, the, uh, the high proportion of children from the state schools, the state schools are not allowed to coach for that exam. So you have to say, it's a huge chunk of kids who go to Amherst, St. John, and they get into grammar schools. They may be helped by parents. They may go and buy the books from was it the parent shop in Riverhead, or they go to Smiths and buy the book. And that's what parents do. Parents help their kids. Uh, so I don't know any child of four, and I think that all responsible parents want to help their kids to do the best. Well, I always feel that you, my job as a parent was to put in front of my children all the opportunities that I could possibly go to, and then they had the opportunity to refuse to take them. And I think no matter where you stand in life, whatever your social status, whatever your ambitions, as a parent, that's what you want to do for your kid. Is there a, a parent here tonight who uh, is currently um, with a child who's on their way to 11 plus who would, would be happy to talk about uh, why they're coaching their child? Is, is there somebody here? Is there a gentleman? Okay. No. <laughs> Hello, my name is David Miller. Um, I'm not quite, not exactly what you asked for, but um, my son um, sat as 11 plus last year and passed um, all the way through the um, his time at Amherst. It had been suggested that he was sinners probably judged level of ability um, and he's, he's a great boy he passed his 11 plus without any tutoring um, but has not been offered a local grammar school now, now I'm kicking myself for not having spent a lot of money to get him privately tutored to have got him um, into Schooners of Judd because he can't be offered a local grammar school and I think it's the system that's wrong it's, this is nothing about the local tutoring. If, if the grammar school place was there for my son, then um, <laughs> we would be in a different position. But why would you not be able to offer that? Then you know, we need a local grammar school. Absolutely. I mean, there is no question or doubt about it. But tutoring and private tutoring will um, continue and will be become the norm here. Um, because the super selectives are going to. That's the only way he's going to get grammar school. Local grammar school, that's it. So, so did your son not, not get a place because of the super selective system? Or has he got a grammar school but not Skinners or Jack? He's been offered Oakwood and Mason. Okay, and are you pleased with that overall? I, I didn't know anything about Oakwood. It, 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 it wasn't one on our list, we hadn't been there. Um, we have we estimate you'll probably have to get up at five forty five on some days to, 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 to get to school. Um, mm. there, there is no um, transport offered to the school. He, he makes his own way there. Um, so we either have to take him to Oxford and he gets the train into the centre of Maidstone and then walks thirty five minutes up to the school or he gets a train through to walks up to the train station, gets a train from there to Tunbridge and then gets a bus from Tunbridge to, to Maidstone. The system, it's the system that's wrong, and, and I think for as long as um, we have this very tiered system, and, and it is all so skewed, that, um, we, that none of this conversation makes an awful lot of sense. Um, tutoring makes perfect sense. Everybody, tutor your children, pay everything you can to get them tutored, because they will then get into this school, a decent school. Mm -hmm. Or a local decent school. I'm not looking yeah. Oakwood at all. I, I actually like Oakwood. I just feel very sorry for my son having to do that amount of commuting every day. Yeah. Richard, is there anything that the KCC can do to try to control what seems to be this power that Skinners and Judd seem to have over this area? No. The legislation, they, they, are, they are independent, they're academies, they can set their own rules. At, uh, so there's nothing we can do about that, I'm afraid. 
I don't know where you live, sir, but afterwards, if you could talk to me, I'll see if I can point you in the right direction to see if we can, uh, in some way, ameliorate the transport problem. Okay, so we'll, we'll try. I'm not sure. It, if you're my county council, if you live in my division, I'll help you. Otherwise, I'll pass you on to uh, the appropriate county council. Just before we do carry on, also, uh, I remember we did a story very similar to the Chronicle about the situation you've had, and uh, a, a teacher from Oakwood was very quick to get in contact with us and tell us about their very excellent record that they've got. So I, I think, you know, Oakwood seems to be, from what I understand, a very good school. Uh, would, uh, we've got some uh, questions here, maybe there. Okay, fine. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay James. I live in Western and I've got a son who's currently in Year 4. Um, and just to go back on, um, I'm now looking at tutoring him. I've been told that he is a possible um, candidate for grammar school. But I would say in my experience, having spoken to other people in our school, that people are tutoring, nearly every single parent is tutoring to get their children into the super selective schools. And perhaps if we had the choice to send our children to a grammar school in Seven Oaks, then um, you know, people may lay off of the tutoring a bit if there were more places and more choice. And I think that you know, the, the, private, um, chil the, school, the children that are going to private schools, they may come and support the grammar school as well. So I just think that we um, should be able to have a choice. And I would like my son to go to grammar school. And I'm not saying I won't look at Null, and I certainly will, but it's all about having a choice. And at the moment we have no choice, unless, as the gentleman said, you know, our children have to get up really early to go down to Tunbridge to get into grammar school. And if, you know, even if they pass the 11 plus, there's no guarantees. But people are tutoring, and they are tutoring to get into Skinners and Judd, particularly on the boys' side of things. I can't speak for the girls' side. Um, but I think, you know, we need more choice, and I support the grammar school application in Seven Oaks. Are you tutoring because you've got a, a lack of confidence in your primary school? That as well. <laughs> Yes, I think there is a big issue in the primary schools in the area. Um, and I know that people are tutoring children from as young as four because they don't they, they feel that they need that extra support and they're not getting that in the local primary schools. As so I'm a, I'm a Western resident, so I can't speak for necessarily the Seven Oaks primary schools. Um, but that is definitely the case. And there's lots of parents that are tutoring from a very young age and it's, it's terrible. Okay, thank you. A gentleman in the grey here, just here. Thank you. My name is James Davis. Um, I'm part of the Christian Free School team. Um, I've also got two children, one in year five and one in year three. And um, I've also taught for many years in uh, grammar schools at Judd and at St Olive's over in Orpington, so the super selective. And then I've taught for two years in senior management over at uh, South London East Morning in the morning school and Hosedale. Um, so, a fairly wide ranging experience. Um, first of all, on the coaching issue, um, I, I know for a fact in a, in a local primary school here, 18 out of 30 in the class in year I think it's two are being coached. So, the coaching is definitely happening around here and at a crazy age, in my view. Um, so, the stats are there and I think it's been borne out tonight. Um, I'd like to kind of change the question, the direct question at Mary. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, the fact that schools are judged on ability, um, and I think it's very unfair, um, the, the schools being judged on ability, and the schools like this, with so many going to grammar school, it's always, you're always on a uh, losing scale. So like what would you like to see in terms of being fair, a fair judge in the school? Because when I was teaching at Judge Solid, it was easier there to get outstanding and good. It was, and with Quite frankly, um, probably when I was morning and home, there's way better teaching, a lot of better systems there that were, they had to do it, but they were never going to get good and outstanding at offset. And I thought it was very, very unfair. And I'd like to ask what you'd like to see to make that change. Um, yeah, we, as Roger said, we recently had our monitoring because we're an academy, we had two HMIs come to visit for two days and we got a good progress. Um, what I'd like to see is a fair system where offset judge you on the progress that your children have made from the time they come into the school to the time that they leave. Uh, there used to be 
something which, if you're not in education, or it's called CVA or contextual value added. So you, you were judged on um, the, the type of school you were, the family of school that you belonged to. Um, so you were, it was almost like a golf handicap. I'm not a golf player, but I do know about golf handicaps. And it was almost a bit like that. So you, you, within your judgment, you, you know, if you were in a London school in a very deprived area, you were given, you know, a certain number of points, as it were. And there was a baseline of, um, it was 100 and then, it was, I think it was 1,000 and then came down to 100. But the context value added progress of your students um, what was what you were judged on. And that's why Bradbourne did really well, because they always did really, really well by their students. Last year with the boys from Wilderness, um, we picked up quite a dire situation when we took over the Wilderness School. Um, uh, the, the boys actually jumped 10 percentage points in their GCSE results, 5A to C, and most of the tuition was done in one year. I had staff who were working every night in food technology, for example, with boys trying to get them through two years of coursework in one year. Nobody ever really in, in the Ofsted team kind of takes that into account. They just look at your raw scores and they say, well, they're not above the national average. In fact, you know, the, the girls' score last year was on the national average, but it wasn't above the national average. But they didn't come into the school with national average key stage two results. So I think that would be a much fairer system. And I think, um, you know, it's a system that grammar schools struggle with as well, because with A star being the top, um, if, you, if you're at St. Olaf's, um, you, you would know this. If, you, if you're in a super selective school, it's very hard to show progress um, with A star just being the, the top. So I'm, I'm not just saying that it's a problem, you know, for, for schools like mine. Um, I, I, I'm trying very hard to get my head around why you wouldn't agree with super selectives if you believe with any sort of selection at all. Um, you know, I, I don't agree with selection as you probably all have realised because I think you shouldn't judge a child at 11 on, you know, two hours of tests or whatever it is. And, and, and the tests, however hard you try, do have some sense of, um, I'm trying to think what the word is, but I think if you are, if, if you have got motivated parents and you've been encouraged to read and your vocabulary is good, you're more likely to do well. You know, if you, if you look, I did 11 plus, I went to grammar school, there weren't any comprehensives. Um, I did really well, I flew through grammar school at the top, I was the ducks when I left my grammar school. I went to university, I did really well there as well. But I worked the whole time. And, um, you know, there, there is competition, but I just think that for a child age 11 to be judged uh, and to be coached, what happens to the children in grammar school who just scraped in after five years of coaching? Are they happy? I don't know. I think I know, but I don't actually know. I know that we take some of them here because you know, they, they're very unhappy and, and they come to Noel Academy and they completely flourish. I'll shut up there. The lady with the red coat on there, please. Um, hello, I'm speaking as a parent of a child of a seven-year-old um, and also as a teacher at Noel Academy, but I'm also someone who is a product of comprehensive education because I was educated in Yorkshire where we don't have grammar schools. Uh, lots of people are saying that they've got no choice but to send their children on a three-hour round trip to go to the grammar school that they've got to in order to access good education. That's actually incorrect. You can send your children here and they can walk. I've taught in seven schools, um, comprehensive schools, uh, schools like Knoll. I've taught in the private sector, I've taught in Spain. This is a very, very good school. Just lay over here and then we'll come over here. Thank you. Hello, me. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that um, there are several reasons why I, I haven't tutored my son. The first was because I never thought that he would be a candidate 
for a grammar school until his CAT test a couple of months ago. Um, and I was advised to, uh, to get him tutoring, and I know most people who um, the schools will advise the parents to get the child tutored, but by that point, um, even if I could have afforded it, <laughs> there was nobody left. Um, there was no tutor in the area with any availability. There was somebody in Maidstone, just one person, but he wanted an extra £20 an hour for the travel. Um, but even if I had tutored my son, he would not be a candidate for um, the uh, super selective schools. He would not. He does not have the ability to get that good a grade. Um, but if the, uh, you know, a local grammar school is very important for me because the idea of my son, um, who has uh, high functioning autism and global language delay, um, travelling um, all the way to to Tunbridge Wells to go to the boys' grammar, which, as far as I know, is the only school, um, the only grammar school that has anything in place for special needs children to give them extra help. It absolutely petrifies me. He, uh, if he can't see you, he thinks you've died. So, um, you know, if things don't happen when they're supposed to, so if the bus is five minutes late, he is going to be in a complete panic, and I'm probably gonna have to spend my, um, every, every morning and every afternoon driving backwards and forwards from Tunbridge Wells. Um, but one thing I would like to know about the, the grammar schools is, um, is there going to be anything in place for special needs children? Any extra help? Because my son has the ability, but he doesn't always understand the world. So it just needs, um, you know, just a little extra time, I suppose. Um, did, can anyone answer that? Okay, Peter. In my experience, if I can just answer your point there, most grammar schools that I'm aware of work especially hard with children with special educational needs and that sort of disability, if they've got the ability. In my experience, most, not all, most grammar schools will go out of their way to make appropriate provision. Okay, well, I'll close uh, if, I can, <laughs> <laughs> if we can just come back to private schools again for a moment, because we, we talked about coaching and in passing I talked to parents who send their children to private schools to get coached for the grammar school and then when they come out of school, they go and have coaching. <laughs> um, but the next statement I'm going to make, you must promise not to laugh. Kent County Council's regulations on coaching for the 11 plus are that no school should coach. And no school includes independent schools. And Kent County Council has said that if it's reported to them that a private school is coaching, then they can withdraw the school and the children from the 11 plus. I did say don't laugh, because there are private schools in Seven Oaks and in Tumbridge Wells, as you know, advertise. Come to us and we will coach you for the 11 plus. And I think there are mechanisms. I don't think it's at all practical, but that rule is actually the rule that many private schools completely flout because their reason for existence is to get the children into grammar schools. And many state schools get round it with the after-school booster club or the breakfast club at eight o'clock so that it's not taking place in curriculum time. And I think not taking it place in curriculum time is the norm for nearly all, but not all, state primary schools. Bridget, is the KCC turn the blind eye to uh, these things going on at primary school? Well, I, I can't answer as authoritatively as you like, but to the best of my knowledge, no. And if there are cases, you should report them and they will be investigated. But of course, I have to say that Kent has no control of what happens in academies or private schools. They are the fiefdom of the school. But if Peter knows of these, surely, and he wishes to carry on from the start, he should have reported this. I have indeed, but I've had no response. <laughs> okay, uh, we go to over there uh, to Nick Chan. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Roger, thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Chan. I'm the 
Well, I speak with the hat of being a parent. Sorry, I've gone trying to get the mic in the right place. Uh, a parent of four, uh, four children, two stepchildren, one who goes to Weald of Kent, one who goes to Bennett, and two who are in uh, primary school in Tempo. I also speak with the hat of being the county council, uh, county councillor for Seven Oaks East, where the uh, where uh, Noel, Noel is, and thirdly, uh, and very proudly, being a governor of Bradbourne and now Noel, and I, I'm, I was a governor some 16 years ago. So I've seen this school, this building, from a long time ago, and six, 16 years ago. It wasn't the best school around. It hadn't got the best reputation. It wasn't full. Mary came some time after I had uh, started to become a governor. And at that time, it was already starting to improve. And it's improved dramatically year on year ever since. Um, the Knoll Academy, it was quite difficult when the Academy was first booted because there were parents of girls who certainly didn't want their girls mixing with what they thought was going to be some quite difficult and challenging boys. Because it, Wilderness was quite a challenging school. I'm delighted to say actually that the um, discipline and the behaviour of the boys and the girls has improved dramatically. And, and I am actually quite surprised. Because what we're really talking about, as a parent, what I'm really most concerned for is that each of my children reach their full potential. I know that they won't reach that potential if the behaviour and the discipline of the school is not absolutely right. And it was something that I, that I made the point, and I keep making the point to Mary, that the discipline and the behaviour has got to be absolutely first rate, and it is of this Academy, and that I'm very proud of. I think back as well, 16 years ago, if I could have leapt forward and thought, well, uh, we've got an academy, a mixed, a, a, a co ed school uh, on one side, and actually with the support of one of the most outstanding private schools in the country, and that's Seven Oaks School. And let's, let's not forget that this academy is supported by Seven Oaks School. And that is making a real difference to the school. Now, I said I had two stepchildren, Alexander, who, who's in what I call the third year of Bennett Memorial. Um, when my wife and I came to decide which school he should go to, we didn't coach him. Uh, he did sit the 11th class, and he was right on the cusp and I could have appealed, and I would have tried very hard, and I, and I may well have been successful, but it wasn't the right school for him. He is not suited to a very intensive, um, selective, male-only school. And to be blunt, I didn't want him to go to wilderness, because I knew that was not the right school for him. But I can honestly say now, that if the academy had been at the place where it is now three years ago, he'd have come here, he'd have come to the academy. And not just because I'm a governor here, I, I mentioned that I'm a governor here, but that allows me to understand a lot better what, what this school is like. So I'm very pleased that we have what I wanted to achieve, what I think that we can still achieve, and that is this community school in Seven Oaks. Now, I'm not trying to speak against the Christian school because Bill also wants a community school. But I don't know why, why we need two schools. We need a school with good discipline, with a good ethos, and to make sure that every child reaches their full potential. I don't think that we need more, more than one school because we have it in spades at this school. And Roger's trying to tell, tell me to sit down and be quiet. No, I just right. want, I'd like to bring Bill in at that point because I thought it was really good. Thank you, yes. So why do we need a faith school in Seven Oaks? Um, first of all, I think choice is a very good thing. As a conservative, Nick, I'm sure you believe in the merits of choice. So rather than having one school that uh, doesn't select on grounds of academic ability in Seven Oaks, we'll have two. And choice will help to drive out standards for everybody. That's been proved through 
decades of education research, so that will help to make Noel Cowley even better, and it will help to keep our school, if we're successful over the next few days, it will help to keep us um, very much on our toes. Secondly, there's a real issue with places in Seven Oaks. If you, if you just discount the grammar for a minute, you say, okay, supposing it's actually 45% of the pupils who go to schools within five miles of, of, uh, of Seven Oaks Station go to grammar schools from the primary schools. Um, so if you just say, okay, they're going to continue to go brown, it's, uh, so we're talking about 55% of the children remaining. There are going, there's an increase in the number of um, children in Southern Oaks over the next six years, projected by Kent County Council statisticians, of 170. There's a massive increase in the number of children. And, of course, we want children to be going to school locally rather than on these long journeys. We talk endlessly about the grammar school, quite understand why. But these children who do not go to grammar schools, also an awful lot of them go very long distances to non-selected schools. Um, and so uh, we've got a shortage of places in Seven Oaks, we've a growing number of pupils, and we want to bring children back who are currently travelling these long distances to school. So that's another reason. And then thirdly, there's the faith school issue, which is if you, some people don't support faith schools, would never send their children here, and that's up there, and that's fine, there'll be a choice. But if you support faith schools, if you're a church or if you want, as many non-church goers do, if you want a faith education for your child, then there is one option really for you in terms of, uh, if you're not a Roman Catholic, which is Ben Memorial, which is probably the best non-selected school, certainly the best non-selected school in West Kent and probably in Kent as a whole. It's a fantastic school. And it's very, very full. It's already extremely difficult to get your child into Ben, ben Memorial from anywhere north of Sermos. And this increase in the pupil population is not just happening here, although it's particularly acute here, it's also happening in Tunbridge and Tunbridge Wells. So these schools in Tunbridge and Tunbridge Wells are themselves filling up. You will not be able to get your child into that memorial school in three or four years' time. So there's a shortage of places generally, and there's particularly a shortage of places for children who are for parents who want their children to go to the faith school. Thank you. Uh, question for Lady Bay, please. Um, my name's Rachel Fiddler, I'm a mum of two boys. Um, oldest is 12 and youngest is 8, so this question is more around the younger one. Um, could you kindly say what would be the admission criteria for your new faith school if it's decided? Yeah. Um, it, 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 you can make it as complicated as you like, but, but very simply, um, half of the places will be for uh, families where the parents and the child go to church and half will be uh, allocated without reference to faith. And then with each of those two categories, it's things like uh, uh, special needs, looked after children, but, but also siblings. Um, and so roughly, at the end of it, all 50% of the children will be allocated by reference to faith and 50% won't. Um, and based on distance also, as the yes. school within, within each one, it will be distance from the school gates, yeah. Thank you. Why can't Mill Academy have a grammar could you use the microphone, yeah. please? Because not everyone is able to show you. Why can't Noel Academy be given a grammar school screen? So, well, um, yeah. Um, well, actually, we are. We we've always taken children with um, who passed the eleven plus, or who would have, but the parents haven't put them forward. Um, un under the Academies Act, you aren't actually allowed to select. Um, by ability, i.e. By, by making um, children take tests. Um, I actually agree with that. But what you can do is say to parents, if your child has passed the 11 plus and you would prefer them to come to North Academy, then they will be placed in one of our two grammar stream sets. Uh, we have two grammar stream sets starting in September. Uh, with, a, with a third set, which will be um, the aspiring to, grammar to the grammar stream set. So they'll be like a, a more able set. So we have two grammar stream sets um, and, and one, Justine, what do we call the third one? Fast one fast track set. And then, but we also will have sets for the um, less able, and they have a, a, a learning support assistant with them practically the whole time. Um, I, I, I actually really enjoy working with all abilities of children. I think that's really important. Life isn't, well, may, maybe life is, you know, segregated. Maybe you can go through your life and not hit the sides. 
you know, maybe you don't have to socialise with people who are less able than yourself or who are less disadvantaged than yourself. I think working in in a community where you have all types of people and all abilities of people is deeply enriching to my life. Um, I really enjoyed working in inner London with a, a with a, a vast number of different faiths and cultures and languages as well. It really enriched my life. Um, some people don't want that, do they? They just want to go through their life with their own kind of, you know, um, friends and colleagues and not actually mix with other people. I think they miss out on loads like that. But we do have two grand streams. What we can't see is you need to pass a test to get in. Um, those grand stream children will do very well. They start with the same curriculum as everybody else. We'll probably change the curriculum for them in year eight. Um, we're looking at introducing something like Latin or ancient Greek or some kind of classic um, classics for them, uh, possibly taught by me because I, I you know, I, I think I, I'm, I can see some people laughing, but actually I'm a linguist and I think learning Latin and ancient Greek, and I see some people nodding. Very, very important for understanding the, the, where our roots in English come from. And I can look at a word and work out what it means because I know what the Latin is. I, I think that is, it is quite important. Um, and there is a big focus on literacy now. Um, I, I don't know why there hasn't always been. Kent primary schools have not got the best reputation for the key stage two results. Um, we do take children here who have got reading age of six. We equally take children who are chronologically, um, their reading age is higher than their chronological age. Um, our task really is to get everybody reading at their chronological age or above um, so they can really access the curriculum. But um, we do have ground stream and I, I actually think that the, the more teachers have different abilities to teach, the better their skills become uh, and the more practised they are in, in their craft because teaching is a craft and to do it well, you, you need to have, I know you talked about your range of experience, you do need to have a range of experiences. Great, thanks. Time's marching on. We are going to close up actually at half past nine. So um, if you've got any last questions, then please let me know. Uh, just Louise has got a question, I know. Prompted. <laughs> <laughs> Kent County Council's proposal is for a four form entry grammar annex and two additional forms of entry at Knoll. This would increase Knoll to a ten form entry school and so an extra 300 or more children on the same site. Will the building work at Null still go ahead according to original plans, or will the building work budget and perhaps even site need to be reconsidered to, to accommodate an extra 10 classes? The building will go ahead as planned. Um, we, we're at planning permission. We've spent, well, I seem to spend forever planning this building because I planned a building on no east and then I had to re-plan for this site when the, when the budget was cut. So that, that planning will go ahead. Um, I don't think, unlike some of the, the panel, that Sevenoaks is big enough for three schools. Uh, if you look at the, I brought all the projections from the Kent County Council um, uh, commissioning plan with me in case I was asked a question about it. Um, the, what seems to be happening, um, birth rates tend to go like that. I don't know whether it's to do with recessions or, but it is fairly cyclical if you look. At the moment, we're in a dip. We then go up. Sorry, you should be doing it that way. Uh, and then the, the implication in the Kent uh, commissioning plan is that we then go down again in 2021 or something like that. Well, it's difficult to tell because they can only use previous predictions and cycles um, to kind of guide them because these children haven't been born yet. Um, so the building will go ahead. 
I think that it, it's very much dependent on whether the, um, the, the free school goes ahead as to what will, would happen next, because we certainly don't need um, three schools in Seven Oaks. I think we would have a real problem filling places and taxpayers' money and would then be funding empty places in schools. So I think if the, if the free school goes ahead, and I have some issues about the fact that 50% would be Christian, um, and uh, going, going to church, would it be Church of England schools? No. I, I, you know, 10% of the population go to, uh, go to church. It's not, much, it's not that much higher. What is it? 15%. So, so 50% uh, would go to the, 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 free, the free school. Um, where fifteen percent go actually go to church. So, um, but I think if we have that and a grammar school and two forms of entry in, in additional in Knoll, we would have a big issue because we'd have lots of free places. One of the biggest things that has happened in education in the last um, in the last six nine months is that. Um, it is, is that the admissions code has changed. So schools now can, they don't have to consult about taking an additional form of entry. So you'll find that Weald of Kent's been mentioned it's taking an additional form of entry. I think there are other grammar schools who may do the same. Um, other, other high schools and, and other all ability schools can also do the same. So Kent's done this amazing commissioning plan um, it's a huge piece of work. It's, I, you know, I had to kill a tree to, to print it off. But, um, but the problem is that it's based on the numbers in schools at the moment and the projections in the birth rate and, and the numbers coming through primary schools. What it doesn't take into account of is any kind of planning on a local level, even in West Kent, because no one knows what is going to happen. So that's part of the answer. But the other part is that there is basic need money. Um, and that's capital funding to build buildings through basic needs. So basic need is if you have a primary school that needs an extra form of entry, they would be funded through basic need. So I imagine that um, if we were in a position where we did have to take two more forms of entry, then we would, need, we would get basic need funding from KCC. Um, I think the, that would be a much cheaper option than building a brand new school. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I think it's kind of watch the space because I, there's just too much uh, uncertainty as to what's, what's going to happen. If in the next few days we hear that the Christian Free School has been approved, Will Kent County Council still pursue plans to build a grammar school in St. Notes? Yes. A four forms, both schools are four forms entry. Yes. Um, I think we're back to boys again, oddly enough. Girls seem to be well provided for. At the moment, because of the history of the wilderness school, there's a large number of boys going out of Seven Oaks to Haysbrook, to Hughes Christie, to get a de what they saw as a decent education. With the Knoll Academy here in Seven Oaks, I think that move out of the town is going to stop or shrink dramatically. And therefore, there'll be a lot more local people wanting places here. It's not just a question of the demography of the town, it's what's happening elsewhere in West Kent. So I actually see numbers increasing. I have a personal concern, which I've seen in other places, that schools get too big. Uh, and we're on eight forms of entry here, and it's an excellent school. I would start to worry if it was starting to get to 10, if there's an alternative. Whether I'm a fan of the free school as such is a different matter, but the, but the opportunity, the funding is there to have another school is one that I would applaud, not just for the competition, but to keep your school a good school. And you, if you don't have it, you're going to be put under considerable pressure 
to increase it, perhaps, beyond where it needs to be. Yeah. Just, you finished. Okay. Just down there, please. Um, yeah, my name's Ed Walker. Um, I'm fairly fortunate. I've got two uh, girls, uh, either in Key Stage 1 or about to go to Key Stage 1. So I've got quite a bit of time. Um, very interesting debate. Um, and I think it, what it comes down to is, is really a simple thing of supply and demand. Uh, I think this school, I don't know a lot about it, but from what I can see, what I've heard, it's very impressive. But I think what we need is, is the choice, the right choice for the people in Southern X. And we can see what the response has been for the grammar school campaign. We can see what the stats kind of predict. But if, if no one can attract, going back to the very first question that was posed to the head teacher, the four or five new children that really ought to be here, rather than travelling, and also we can have a base in Southern X to have the, the thousand or so children who seem to be doing 20, 30 mile round trips or, or more. It just seems common sense. Um, what happens with the, the Christian bit, that may be required. Uh, I personally think it will happen. Um, we also need to back, uh, bear in mind the fact that you know, we voted the Kent County Councils in and over 95% of them have voted to put in place a grammar school in a few years time. I'm fortunate I can actually wait for 2015. I'd love it to be in place. Um, and be able to observe how well that does. And at the same time, consider the no academy option if my children aren't of that ability of education. But at least we've got the choice and we've got it in the town that we want to develop further. And there's lots going on in Southern but we don't seem to have enough schools, enough places. And it seems crazy that we don't have that kind of infrastructure here on our doorstep for all of us that are living in Southern in Western, Hopford, or wherever. And the gentleman at the end of the road seems to want to. Um, yeah, uh, congratulations to, to Mary. I came along with an open mind, but I've certainly been sold on this academy now. And I've got two children that are uh, a few years off, but I really feel very strongly behind the, the local school campaign and also agree with Nick's points earlier. Brings me on to um, the Christian Free School um, and the big. I'm just not getting it. I've got to be perfectly honest. I mean, I can understand why people in the area require a grammar school. It's the case that Tunbridge has got one, Tunbridge Wells has got one, and I think that the coaching of children is massively counterproductive, and I think people should read a poem by Philip Larkin when they get home, which is called This is the Verse. It's got a very interesting first line. I think a lot of parents in Southern Oaks should be aware of that when they're dragging their kids, kicking and screaming through the 11 plus, and the effect that that might have them through their teenage years. But getting on to the Christian point, you mentioned um, 15%, but obviously that includes uh, a demographic that's well outside of children going to school. So I actually think that if you look to the number of research like I have, I think it's less than 10%. And then there are the children that are there because their parents have dragged them along because they want to get into Lady Boswell's and schools like that. So actually we're talking about a number that's well less than 10%. How, how in any way is that representative of this community, um, uh, a community that would look forward and that can be inclusive in any way, shape or form. I mean, surely if you create one faith school of a Christian faith, all it does is create segregation within a society that's supposed to be multicultural. I'm just not getting it. Uh, well, uh, just on the last point about multicultural, um, Seven Oaks is not a multicultural society. There are parts of the UK which are very multicultural. Seven Oaks happens not to be. And uh, that would be a, a good discussion point that we could have if it was. Uh, less than 2% of people in the Seven Oaks district say that they are of an ethnic minority. That's um, not the point I'm making. Obviously, um, in terms of you know, not getting the case for it, um, in order to put forward our bid, um, and we'll find out whether we're successful and, and, and we might be or we might not, we just have no idea, but in order to put forward our bid, we have to go and ask parents to s sign a, a, a piece of paper or an online survey and say whether they would they had to tell us the years of their children and also the primary school they went to. So these were real life parents from this area. Um, and they had to say whether they would like to send their children to our school, and if so, whether they would make it their first choice. Um, we have to, if we're going to be um, opening in 2013, next year, which will be a very uh, rapid time scale if we're selected, then we have to have 120 children for next September. Um, 2013, and then another 120 children for 2014. 
and that's children who are currently in years four and five. So we had 216 parents tell us that they would make our school their first choice for those two years. So we only need 240. So there is a big demand for this school. People may not be able to understand it or whatever, or question it, but there is a very big demand for this school. It's preying on people's insecurities there, because parents oh. will always have the demand for a school that they might think is slightly better, in the same way that two thirds of schools in the countries of, uh, in this country are Church of England still. When we're stuck, I mean, one of the things we've been debating this evening and just listening is the fact that Kent County Council, Kent as an area, this part of the country, we're stuck in a bygone era. I mean, we're talking about single sex schools, we're still talking about grammar education, and now we're talking about faith schools. I mean, honestly, I could be sat here 100 years ago. I mean, it's archaic, it's absolutely archaic, but you should be thinking that going forward is about creating a school that is, it is based around values that very few people actually uphold. I'm actually a good Christian with a small c, you know, as a, I, I have strong morals, and I'm sure this school has. But I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not understanding the need in, in a community where, where, in any community, where few or few people are attending a church. Well, all, all I can do is ask you to, uh, you know, uh, what? explain why we have all these, so I'm not really well, asking you, but the, but, but the fact is we have these uh, numbers. We also have, uh, you know, uh, an extremely successful school in Van Memorial School in Tunbridge Wells which is heavily, heavily oversubscribed. So I, I, I think you're, of course, entitled to your point of view, and you might not want to send your child anywhere near our school, but there are many, many parents who would like an education like that for their children. Thank you, Bill. Lady in blue, please. Hi, um, my name's Lizzie Vaughan. Um, I have a child who's currently here for, who I am hopefully going to have tutored because I want her to at least have a chance of passing the 11 plus. Having said that, we are also uh, practicing Christians and we are very interested in the Christian school. And if that doesn't go ahead, then I'm scared because I want to know that my child is not gonna have the same experience as this young lad and whose parents are sitting in front of me. I, I know I have the choice to send her here, um, but if she were to pass the 11 plus, um, you know, there's an awful lot of travelling involved, and unfortunately the Alex won't be ready by then, will it? So I'm very concerned, not about the ethos of the Christian school, because I think we've had opportunities to discuss that previously. Um, this is to talk about the future, not about the ethos of the schools. Um, and I don't actually want you to respond to this. I want the powers to be to go away and do something about it. There's been an awful lot of rhetoric this evening. I am actually a teacher myself. I work with special needs children up in London. And I love, sorry, I don't know your name, but the head teacher here. I love your ethos, and I think it's fantastic. In fact, like you were saying, if we weren't starting from here, I would want to go where you want to go as well. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I just would like to dispel the myth that this is not a good school. My daughter has got friends at grammar schools. She's just taken her GCSEs, and I fully expect her to get equal grades to her friends in both the school, in the grammar schools, so which I am very proud of, the school and of my daughter. So please, I mean, she's not getting up at five o'clock in the morning. She's taken her 20 minutes to walk here and she walks home talking to her friends that live locally. Brilliant. And uh, what a nice way to finish off the evening. Okay, thank you. To our panel, to Richard Parry, Bill Latimer, uh, Peter Reid, and to Mary Boyle. Okay.